morning we're going to talk about marriage. <laughs> we're actually going to talk about working together, and frankly, what for me is one of my favorite things about Jesus, which I know is kind of a weird statement for someone like me to say, but just to be clear, I, I have a bias and you have one, but for me, that one of my favorite things about Jesus is I understand him in the Gospels, and frankly, as I understand this whole narrative, this cohesive story about God and people, Is this, and the observation is that Jesus, long before he asked people to get eyeball to eyeball, invited people to get shoulder to shoulder. And I just love that about him, that that when Jesus showed up, and and those of us who would say we follow him or believe in him, which is interesting because he actually never asked people to believe in him, he only asked people to follow him. I mean, he assumes that belief will follow in its own regard, which is its own, I think, gutsy thing that John Ortberg points out. But when Jesus gets ready to do what Jesus is here to do, Uh, and many of us would say that was the most important thing that's ever happened on the planet, the work he did. He didn't say, hey, let's, let's study the Torah together. Let's sit down in synagogue and have this long intellectual conversation. And again, I'm not saying that those are bad things, but what stands out to me is actually what he did is he said, hey, let's, let's go build a fence together. Like, let's go work together. Like, his initial invitation wasn't to talk, it was to work And it would seem, when you then read the story, because there's lots of talking that happens, but it's always while working is occurring or even in between working happening. And it gets me wondering this question of what if, what if there's something worth observing there? And what if the types of people he called and the types of work he called them to is actually an important part of our, uh, what, what theologians would call our, our Christology, our understanding of Jesus, our understanding of the kind of life he invites us into. In Matthew 4, just in, 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 you know, I was like, what would be the verse that everybody's read if they've ever read a verse? So here we go, Matthew 4. Jesus is, says this, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, uh, for they were fishermen. Interesting, wasn't it? That like men of calloused hands was who he went to first. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out to fish for people. So there it is. Not like, hey, have you thought about Psalm 23? Like, hey, do you see that pile of lumber over there? I gotta do something with it. Would you like to join me? At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, they were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their nets and and their father and followed him. I guess the question that I want to ask this morning is, is it it more than trivial information that Jesus' first disciples, and I guess if anything I'm pointing a finger at myself, but but they, they, they they weren't in university, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with university, they weren't leading an intense Bible study, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Bible study. They were the type of guy where they, you shake their hand and you go, oh, I'm a sissy. <laughs> right? Because they were calloused and they were hardworking. They, they were these men who knew how to get a job done. And is, is that a noteworthy piece? And is it important? And, in, and could it be that this God understands that part of the way he made us is, is to work shoulder to shoulder and trust that the face-to-face, yeah, it's important, but, but maybe of secondary importance. And even when you begin to look at the scriptures and go like, okay, but Adam, there's some face-to-face stuff that happened. There's some really intimate things that occur. And I'm not arguing that those things aren't important, but it's interesting, isn't it, that it tends to be written by and experienced by people who, who are in the middle of a lot of really real life. You know, it's David in a cave, and what we know is David didn't get to live in the cave. This is just this moment that he had where he was hiding But before and after that, there was a lot of work happening, he and the Lord together. Or think about how the story starts, Genesis 1, and I know it's full of distractions and let's try to avoid them because, quite frankly, I think we've kind of trashed Genesis 1 by making it a story about how old is the earth, and I'm really not convinced that that question was even in those people's minds. That what is going on in Genesis is this understanding of this God and I, whether, you, whether you hold a 6,000-year-old view or a 10-billion-year-old view, I, I, don't, I think we can agree to disagree on that, and we ought to. But what you have is a God who, who, who points out there's, there's this ocean, and it's full of creatures, and, and there's this land, and it's full of creatures, and there's vegetation everywhere. And people who understand what it means to own creatures and have land and have vegetation know that that stuff, it, it, it doesn't just stay static, it requires work. Just like a house that has trim, just like a job that, that has lots and lots of bills to pay. I mean, 
the, the Genesis 1 portrays a world that's beautiful and full of creative potential and it's, it's kind of, I think of it like this, like why did I buy a house? Right? Renting is great. Genesis 1 is like home ownership. It's, it's this God who's done these beautiful things and it's a gift and it's grace and don't get me, take me for granted or don't misunderstand me. I love owning a house but it comes with a lot of work. L- listen, listen to Genesis and just the way the story occurs. In, in Genesis 1, the Lord said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Why? So we can have tea together. No, so that they may rule Work over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them, which begs this question of like, okay, but that's kind of vague. What does it mean to be created in God's image? And that's what this is attempting to ask. What does God do that makes us like him? And there's lots of answers, but look at the next verse. God blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. It's fun, but it's work. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the... Come on, that was funny. Rule uh, over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. You you know the way I I think you can read Genesis 1 is... It it sounds like this. Uh, It sounds like this. Hey, you have a truck, don't you? It's a trap, right? Everybody who owns a truck knows, like, you don't answer that question. (laughs) God says, Adam, you, you guys have a truck, right? Or, or I did this actually to the staff this week and Hannah called me on it. I, I said, hey, what are you guys doing at one o'clock on Thursday? <laughs> and Hannah goes, why do you ask? It's a trap. It, like this God seems to be doing that with people where, where he's got something going on and it's beautiful and it's creative and it's full of potential and people's role is to come alongside and the face-to-face stuff seems to be the, the segue. It seems to be the bonus. But the shoulder-to-shoulder seems to be the implied. Or think of it this way. Who, who are the characters in the Bible that come to mind for you? And if they're vegetables, that's okay. That means that, that you just grew up in that era. But who are, who, are the, who are the people in the text that come to mind for you? And who are the heroes? And who are the people that you love? And what are the stories that you've kind of wrapped your life around? I mean, there's, there's Esther, and there's Miriam, and there's Mary, and Mary, and Mary, and Mary. There's lots of Marys. There's Joseph. There's David. There's a theme to those names, isn't there? In every case, and this is part of what terrifies me about my job, if I'm being honest. In every case they tend to be very blue-collar, very hands-in-the-soil, very get, getting work done. And if anything, guys like me who, who, who make their living by reading things and studying things and thinking things, they tend to be the villain more often than not. That this God seems to come alongside and, and discipleship, we've turned it into this Western theological enterprise, but I think we actually have a really good word for it in the West. It's called apprenticeship. And it's less about, hey, let me share my ideas so that you can pass the test, and more about, let me work, and you watch me work, and see if who I am doesn't rub off on you. Moses, for me, is that guy. I I heard a sermon on the day I graduated high school before I really even followed Jesus. It was taught by a guy named Garris Elkins, who was a missionary, I believe, and it was about Moses, and to this day, it's it's still a reference point for me. Uh, I, I so identify with the, the narrative of Moses. But think of, the, think of how that narrative goes. There's this guy, Moses, who, who's born in some kind of privilege, but then he comes to this realization that God has more for his life, and he sees the opportunity to serve people in a certain way, and he catches a vision for how he could change these people's life, and he tries to change their life. Only problem is they didn't, that didn't necessarily take. It didn't work out. They were like, we don't want to follow you. That meant that he didn't start a war. It meant he committed murder. Fine line there, but for Moses, his attempt to start a revolution became a murder. He fled to the desert. He hung out for 40 years. Now, part of what I love about Moses is that he, and there's different terms we could use for this, uh, I, I like the word he was willful. Like, to a fault, Moses saw things that needed to happen and he made them happen, sometimes without God. He, 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 he took human initiative very seriously. He was, a, he was a guy with a bias for action, and it got him in trouble. And then he ended up in the desert, and I think what he learned in the desert was surrender. He, he learned humility. But here's what stands out to me. After 40 years in the desert and hanging out with sheep and reinventing himself, 
God, and we don't know the timeline and how God works, but God decides he's going to respond to the cries of his people who were slaves in this country called Egypt. And, he, and, and this God has, we've already covered, yoked himself to people, like almost to a fault, does almost nothing outside of partnership with people. And this God goes looking for a leader. And where does he go? He doesn't go to a classroom. I value classrooms. It's like God goes, oh, I remember there was this guy... I mean, he was obnoxious. He would just run his head into a wall over and over and over and over. There was this guy who, he had a lot of faults, but one of them wasn't action. His name was Moses. I'll bet you he would be perfect for it. And he asked this guy who has a long history of stepping on God's toes to come get shoulder to shoulder with him. And and I just, I love, I love the call because I think that there's so much behind what's going on here. I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. This is God to Moses. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Ites. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prezites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Moses is like, I can't. Check the list 40 years ago. And I, I actually think that that was the 40-year lesson. I don't know that Moses would have said I can't at 40. I think he erred to the side of confidence and chutzpah. And yet it's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? It's that what would you rather have would you rather try to breathe life into something that's not there, or would you try to rein something in that has too much of it? This God takes a person who knows a hard day's work and says, hey, let's, let's, let's go do this thing. And it, it gets me wondering about this question. What, what, if, what if in your efforts and my efforts, what if in our desire to connect with God and have the strength of that relationship, what if God has tipped his hand that a big piece of his formula is find a cause bigger than yourself, get shoulder to shoulder with me, don't worry so much about the intellectual piece, though that's also important, but just trust that I'll shape and form you. You know, there was a saying that was said often in the environment that I first started following Jesus is, and it sounded, in, and it sounded like this. They, they would often say, and it was one of those implied culture things where now I look back and I go like, oh no, that was pretty intentional. That they would often say, uh, the best way to get well is to help someone else get well. And I wonder if sometimes in our efforts to get close to God and to visit the self-help section and to do the things that we do with good intention, if we don't miss that God, through Christ especially, already showed us the way to him is first and foremost on his shoulder, not always across the table looking him in the eye. What, 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 if, what if Paul was onto this you know, one of Paul's refrains in the New Testament was this statement that he, he seemed to value so much where he would say, do everything as though working for the Lord. Like Paul's vision of spiritual growth was not all that similar, in my opinion, to the modern discipleship strategy. Because it was more like, there's a pile of lumber, that guy knows me, go build a house with him, and I think you'll be transformed. And, and it brings us back to the original dream. And we've kind of purposely, if you've stumbled in here this morning, we've kind of purposely set typically this weekend aside in order to provoke this thought and to kind of keep ourselves on this track. And it's this, what happens if a community of people don't think of this as the spiritual pinnacle, but what happens if a community of people so catch a vision for how God wants to work with them in their lives that when they walk out the door to work tomorrow, without pretentiousness or arrogance, but with a sense of clarity of purpose, they understand that the real work, the real discipleship, the real following of God happens when they punch another airline ticket, when they, when they serve another meal, when they prepare another day's curriculum, when they change another diaper. And what happens if this community says, Christianity is not what happens just when there's a logo in the event that contains a cross, but it's what happens when people connected with God trust fully that this God wants to get to know them by walking shoulder to shoulder. And it leads to the second question of what if what's true between us and God and you and God, what if that's just as true about one another? You know, I don't think it's lost on anybody that, that more and more what they're saying is that we're, we're the loneliest culture 
in, in recorded history. Uh, the metrics, I'm doing some reading right now from Cal Newport, who's this brilliant thinker. Uh, the, the metrics on our students and, and, and the ratios of self-harm and depression and anxiety and suicide are off the charts right now, unprecedented. And the irony is they're alone, but they're not. And I wonder if, if what applies between you and I, or excuse me, us and God, if it doesn't also apply to the way people work. That relationship, if you make the relationship about the relationship, you kill the relationship. But if you make the relationship about a mission together, a purpose together, an objective together, you end up with a relationship. Now, I have a bias here, and I have to be honest with that, so just so you know, I come from a family of origin that's kind of terrible at the whole, like, let's sit down and have long, intimate conversation. It's ironic, because I do that professionally, though I'm not very good at it, and I love having coffee with you all, but I had this funny memory this week, and there's no bitterness in it whatsoever, just to be clear, but I remembered in my mid-20s, when I was first learning to take students to coffee and all the work that, that I was learning to do, there was one Christmas where I, I bought my dad a handful of City Brew gift cards, and this touching 20-something letters saying, hey, I'd love to get together and have coffee a few times this year and talk. And it was two or three years later, my dad handed me the gift cards back. He's like, hey, you should probably use these. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not bitter because the reality is if I'm going to paint my house, he'll be the first one there and the last one to leave. So my family of origin has a bias. In fact, I understand intellectually that family dinner is like a keystone habit to the health of our kids, and yet I'm the worst to sit down and go, now what are we doing? But all that being allowed, what if part of the danger is we make the relationship the goal and then it gets awkward and we kill the relationship? What if getting shoulder to shoulder with people, think about where your relationships have been the strongest in your life. I'll bet you, you think of a person and an objective like a couch that you had to get up the stairs maybe, or, or a team that you played on, or in my conversations with former military personnel, my understanding is that one of the hardest parts about leaving the military and a piece of the whole PTSD puzzle and everything else is the sense of isolation and loneliness because for a season of time, you shared the biggest objectives ever with people and now you just wave in the grocery store. What if shoulder to shoulder is the way that we're wired? And what would happen if that's true? I mean, think of the disciples pulled around a mission together. And the way we think about relationship around here for what it's worth is we, we think that our job is to create platforms upon which you can get shoulder to shoulder with God and shoulder to shoulder with people. But we also operate on the assumption that not all people have the same chemistry with one another. And that's okay. And so if we tell you here's five people and now those are your best friends, then we create an awkward situation because you don't feel like a Christian anymore because you're not close friends with them. And it's not that they're not Christian or you're not, it's just that there's not a lot of chemistry. But if we create a platform and we say something to you like, hey, why don't you just get shoulder to shoulder with God? And then every once in a while, look over your shoulder and see if there's somebody there that you have enough in common with that you actually want to go deeper with. What if that would actually work? And that's, that's the way we think about this together. Paul, I think, thinks in similar ways. Uh, there, there's something in 1 Corinthians, and, and I'll, I'll stop pontificating, but I want to look at this. There's a story in 1 Corinthians that, like 1 Corinthians is one of those books for me, quite honestly, that I read it and I go like, am I a Christian? Because I don't understand any of this, and it's so foreign to me. And so I spent some time this summer working through N.T. Wright's commentary through 1 Corinthians, and it kind of helped, and it kind of left me confused. But there's one section that just popped for me, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul is talking to a community of people, much like this one, who were trying to understand what does it mean to get shoulder to shoulder with God and one another. And here's what he says. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Now, there's some foreign concepts here, and it's part of why I'm excited to walk through this. Because that whole love is patient, love is kind, that section that you hear at weddings, that's what precedes this. And now Paul is breaking it down like, here's the different gifts. Well, prophecy, it's important in, like, in our brains and your brain, it probably goes to predicting the future and weirdos. And that's like a fraction of a percent of what prophecy involves in the Bible. What it really involves, and one way to read this, is to say Wisdom. That what prophecy is, is when one person offers wisdom, insight, counsel to a larger group of people that they find helpful. So, so that's what prophecy is in this context. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, 
uh, but to God, indeed, no one who understands them, they utter mysteries by the Spirit. So this other weird thing is tongues, but what Paul is doing here is contrasting tongues and prophecy. Now, tongues, another loaded thing, and some of you have some religious background of this, and others not so much, and I think there's layers in the New Testament of what's going on, but here what seems to be going on is this. Tongues, in this instance, is a way of connect. the way we might say it today is, it's a way of connecting beyond our consciousness, so lots of forms of meditation or centering prayer. It's a language that a person probably doesn't understand themselves, but, but it's really about you and God communicating gratitude and adoration to one another. It's, you know, it's whatever that moment is for you where God just felt right there on the run or on listening to the music or whatever. It's very personal. It's very intimate. And what Paul is doing is contrasting the value <clears throat> of prophecy and tongues. But the one who prophecies or the one who gives wisdom speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophecies edifies the church. So he's not saying right, wrong, good, bad. He's just saying they, they, they serve two different functions. I'd like every one of you to speak in tongues. In other words, I'd like every one of you to have those personal ecstatic experiences, perhaps, but I would rather you have prophecy. In other words, I'd, I'd rather you like, have something to offer those around you. The one who prophecies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. We could think of it this way. One morning, a couple, thousand, a couple hundred years ago, two individuals went off to work. One of them walked through town to a little lot of land that he had purchased years before. And when he got there, he continued his work on his house. And, and his house, this was in this part of the world, what the outside looked like was of no consequence, but the inside was beautiful. It surrounded a courtyard, it had marble walls, the furnishings were perfect, and he knew that very soon he and his family were going to enjoy an exquisite personal house. The other man walked right to the town square where they were building a building that would take up half a city block, and when he arrived, the foreman gave him tasks, just like he had given everyone else who arrived tasks, some to carving doors and others to picking through stones for mosaic, uh, others to, to carving columns. The second guy was there to build a cathedral, and it was a building that would stand for a thousand years, and it would beckon people to the narrative of God and the story of Jesus. See, what Paul's not doing here is saying, it's not okay to have a nice personal house, you should only build cathedrals. He's just simply contrasting that there's two, uh, dare we call it, baseline perspectives, initial perspectives with which we can live. One is a spirituality that's predominantly about me. And I don't, I, I, personally, I'm not all that interested in faulting that. He's just noting the obvious. If, if you're into tongues and that's your total emphasis, that's okay, but it's really about you and God. And the other is an emphasis upon how one's spirituality serves others and kind of goes the long way around the bar in serving itself. Right, here's the way N.T. Wright says it. Go ahead to that next slide. He says, the contrast is between the person who builds up their private spirituality and the person who in public worship builds up the whole community. The last thing I want to do is shame, ridicule, conjole, or argue that personal spirituality is not good. And frankly, the last thing I want to do is tell somebody that they're disqualified because they don't do Jesus and follow Jesus in community. I, I think there's some conversations, but frankly, I, I, I get it. And sometimes it's appealing to me too. But where we've paid our fee and made our decision, and I think where we all have to, is to go, so what approach are you going to take? What, what is going to be your own personal spiritual growth strategy? Is it... What is so popular and frankly so common and frankly, this is the Jesus I prefer. A God who says, I just want to know you in your personal space and I, I, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the God of the self-help. Or is, is Jesus trustworthy? Like when Jesus said things like, here's the problem, when you find yourself, you lose yourself. And when you lose yourself, you find yourself. It, it, is, is that timeless truth? Does it work? And what we've built this place upon historically and why this is so important to cover once a year is to go, we are collaborating with people who are all in on this idea of getting shoulder to shoulder with God and shoulder to shoulder with one another and trusting that the personal fruit of that will be there. We, we, we call it ownership because what we say is we don't do membership because membership is about privilege and ownership is about responsibility. We've said in the past that a party's more fun when you have a job, and I think that's especially true if you're an introvert. And I guess the question I'm asking this morning is, what, 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 if, 
What if we're designed to do relationship with God and others shoulder to shoulder long before face to face? And, and what, if, what if it actually works? So there's that card in that chair, and I'm going to ask you to grab it. This feels like one of those timeshare things that you swore you'd never go to again. And I'm sorry if it does, but, but, but as you look at that card, here, here's what I want you to understand is what that card represents is every task, every responsibility, every, every job that has to get done 48 Sundays a year, however many times we gather, not next week, so not 52. And here, here, here's what I love about even this morning. Like, like the, the reason you have coffee is because back in May, because we build our schedules three months at a time, and we don't call you the night before and go, hey, God's going to fall off his throne if you don't come make coffee, so you better cancel your, your, your camping trip. We erred in the other direction, and there's always room for people. We do have emergency subs. Of course, that comes up. But, but here's the way we roll. Is the reason there was coffee this morning was because in May, I think of where you were in May. In May, someone inconvenienced themselves to such an extent that they circled a Sunday in August, and went, I'll build my life around, around making coffee that weekend. And the reason why your kids are getting taken care of and narrate kids is the same reason. Because back in May, some teacher who, who also has kids, who also is busy, who also doesn't know what their schedule is going to be perfectly this summer, they pre-decided back in May that they would teach kids this morning. And for us, this whole thing, and, and here, here's the trap. And my, my friend Jim always says, if you want to get something done, ask somebody who's already busy. Like the danger of this model would be, well, I'm busy. And, and we respect that. If you're busy, kind of like giving, no one's going to call you and go, you don't serve. But here's the reality that I just want to convey. Everybody's busy. And the way this place exists is by people who are busy pre-deciding that their spiritual growth plan is to come shoulder to shoulder with God by serving people. And in the process of that, getting shoulder to shoulder with people and trusting that when they get months and really years down the road, they'll find themselves connected with both God and others. And to be honest, there's different layers of connection because some of you, and I, I'm, I'm constantly, uh, constantly advocating for you. I understand some of you aren't here for relationship, and that's okay. You're here because you just need a place to think and to listen, and you're trying to figure this God thing out, or you came from a bad past experience. We totally get that constantly arguing like this has to be a safe place for people to hide. The trick is this. If when you no longer need to hide, if when that's over, you don't get involved, then there's not a church for the next person who wants to hide. Not a guilt thing, just an opportunity thing, and it's a way that we, we don't do a yearly annual meeting. This is as close as we get, and it's our way of saying, Here, here's the strategy, here's the game plan, here's the way we roll. We gather and we scatter. Our growth strategy, both personally and spiritually, is the same. Come serve with people. Get shoulder to shoulder with God. My, my friend Fred used to always say back in Billings, and I think it applies no matter what your lot in life, but he, he spent a lot of time with single people, and he would say to single people all the time, just find a place where you can be excited about serving God, and then every once in a while look over your shoulder and see if there's someone working alongside you that you might want to get to know better if you know what I mean. That, that's, that's the playbook. That's the invitation. And we would love for you to join us. And here's the trick, is we already prayed. Because <laughs> so, I get it. Like, there's this, like, I'm going to take this home and pray, and I respect that and all that. But, but, but here's the deal. The, the staff is ready this week to connect online or on, on the phone or to have coffee, ironically, but we value that. And to help you get integrated and connected however you want. And, and, and we would love for you to be a part of this next year. But... But here's the unapologetic reality of Narrate Church. We exist so long as there's people that, that are willing to pre-decide, both with time and money, that they buy into this vision of creating a place that's safe for people who don't get it and helpful for people who do. Let me pray. God, thanks <clears throat> um, for your people. And God, we just... It's important to say out loud, Lord, we, we are well aware that there are a lot of really awesome movements of yours in our town, uh, that there's not one good church, but there's a plethora of good churches that serve different personalities and different backgrounds. And God, we, we feel uh, real called to and connected to our own specific ecclesiology and just way of doing things that says we're, we're, 
We're going to err to, err to the side of working hard, building fences, trusting that you'll form us in the, in the way and trusting that you'll connect us as we do. So God, for people here who maybe have been sitting in these rows for years and now is the time, we, 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 God, my, my prayer would be that whatever conversations happen interpersonally right now, that they'd be conversations of grace and love, not shame and guilt. We have this invitation to serve our community together, God, and we, we trust that our future is staked to that. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.